right. And welcome you saints on this beautiful Sunday, 3rd of March, 2019. I welcome you to the presence of the Lord. Welcome you to the reading of the word. And I pray that our hearts will be a fertile soil to receive right now in Jesus' name. So we are reading from Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Exodus 4, 1 to 9, and it reads, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. And he said, Cast it to the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob had, has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said, verse 6, to him, Now put, out, put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be if they do not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry, dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Wonderful and everlasting God. Father, we thank you for your everlasting word, for your eternal word, your word that is tried seven times over, and it is purer than pure. My, my Lord and my God, Father, I lift you up this morning. I worship you for your word. And Lord, I pray that the hearts of your people will just open up and receive. Lord, I plant the seed of your word in every heart. Father, let, oh Lord, the hearer take this word and run with it. And let your name and your name alone be glorified in heaven and on earth. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, the title of this message is Daring to Trust God. Daring to trust God. So what is it about trusting God that is so difficult with human beings? Why is it that, you know, we find it difficult to trust God? And I'm talking on every level. Old believers, young believers new believers, all sorts, and everywhere in between. The only, you know, or let me say some of the things I believe is just because God has given, he said he made us in his likeness and in his image. So he has given us the will to choose. And because of that free will, we become rebellious because of that free will, we choose to do our own thing. And when the master says, go left, we say, but look, right is better. When the master says, turn and look to the right, we say, oh, but see, the left is better. So we are disobedient because we have free will. 
because we have the ability to choose. And this gives us a false self-image and subsequently leads to pride, which is essentially willful sin. According to Psalm 19, verse 18, it's presumptuous, willful. I can just touch that. Psalm 19, verse 13. Um, okay, let, let me just um, start from verse 12. It says, who can understand his errors? That means our mind keeps telling us, oh, you are doing right. Don't, 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 don't listen to God. Who can understand his errors? We are sinning, and yet we are giving ourselves excuses why we should do what we are doing, rather than just obeying God, listening to him, and doing what he says. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Those things that I do, sometimes I hear in my spirit. The Holy Spirit says, don't do it, but I justify it. Cleanse me from such faults, secret faults. Verse 18, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin, from defiantly sinning against you. Let these things not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. So those little secret faults that the Holy Spirit nudges me about, that I overlook, let them not have dominion over me and then I will be innocent of great transgression. Because when I listen to those little nudges, I'm preserved from going into deeper sin. Like I said, when, when, we, when we, because we have the ability to choose or to, not, or, you know, to do or not to do, if we keep on like that, subsequently, because of that false self-image, it becomes pride, like what happened to Lucifer. A false self-image. I can also be like the most high. False self-image, which is pride and willful sin. And then he willfully disobeyed God. So Psalm 19, he said, Lord, preserve me. Protect me from this you know, presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. So, those are, you know, that's one aspect of what makes us not to listen to God. Another aspect is fear, fear of the unknown. But the thing is, if we knew everything ahead of time, then there can't be an element of trust there. If God had to tell us A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H until Z, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 to the end, then what, where is the trust? Why is he God? Why does he say he loves us more than we know? Why, why does he say we should allow him to lead us? And for those who let him lead, eventually we realize, yes, that his way was actually better than what I thought. So it's, a, it's the fear, fear of the unknown. But today, since we are treating the topic, daring to trust God, we have, when that fear comes, we ask the Holy Spirit, take this fear away from me. Let this fear not have dominion over me so that it will not lead me to disobey you or walk away from you. And one thing I want us to know right at the beginning as we are laying the, the, the foundation, we are not asking you to trust a fellow human being. 
And we are not even asking you to trust yourself. It's about trusting God. If you know he is God and you know he's talking to you, that's the person we are talking about. The creator of heaven and earth, the creator of things you, you can see and the things you cannot see. So he's far above and far beyond our imagination. The things we can see, the things we can imagine, the things we cannot even see and cannot even imagine. So if we cannot imagine those things, those are the areas where he says, just trust me. Just trust me on this. It's not a fellow human being who can change his mind anytime. We are talking about the all-knowing and all-loving father. We are talking about the all-knowing God. All-knowing God, all-loving God, all-loving father. God is love and he treats us only out of the place of love. Even when we sin, he manufactures a way out. He develops a way out. He brings plan B. So he loves us more than we love ourselves. The one that can do and can undo. The one with whom all things are possible. That is the God that we are talking about. Daring to trust him. Because he knows what we don't know. That's the one we are expected to trust. Not ourselves and not any fellow human being. So when we or if we can learn to trust this God. Then the possibilities become Endless, because he himself is endless. Because from the Exodus we are reading, he told Moses, I am that I am. That means you cannot put your finger on every area of who I am. I am so much you cannot describe me. I am uncontainable. You cannot put me in a box. So if you cannot put me in a box... That means there are things I can do that your mind cannot comprehend. So just learn to trust the I am that I am. And he is that in anything and everything. So the question is, how much can we dare to trust this God? And the answer is, in anything and in everything. We just have to to ask the Holy Spirit for that spirit of faith, the ability, the ability to do what he says we should do. In that Exodus we read, Exodus 4, verse 4, and that is so significant, and it's easy to remember, Exodus 4, verse 4, says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Take the snake by the tail. That's daring. I, I know how I would feel if somebody asked me to pick up a snake by the tail. So that's daring. Do we, can we dare to trust this God? Take it by the tail. And the book says, and he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. But imagine yourself in that position. You, 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 you already be doing it in your pampas, <laughs> you know. If, if you, when in the, the, the verse three says, when the Lord said, cast it down, he, he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. You, you run from certain things. Something you are running from, God is saying, go back and pick it with your own hand, bare hands. 
something you are physically running from. That's daring. But the difference is that we need to know God's voice. Not just to jump into daring situations. If God says, pick the snake by the tail, then you know that you can do it. Peter clearly asked Jesus, if it is you, beat me, come out and walk on water. Peter didn't just start walking on water. He had to hear the voice, the command, a personal invitation. Don't say it's written in the Bible, Peter walked on water, so let me just go to the river and walk on water. Such things has to be a personal We are training to hear God's voice. That's why I said at the beginning, those little nudges that the Holy Spirit nudges you when you do those little things. It's training you. For a greater thing. That's why you, you have to say, God, preserve me. Protect me from presumptuous sin so that I will not commit greater transgressions. I will not go into deeper things. So this is God daring Moses. Something he physically ran away from. So there'll be situations in your life that you say, "Uh uh-uh, that is beyond me. And God is saying, go and do it. Go and do it. I'm sending you. So that's why we have to learn to hear God's voice. Not just do it because A did it. Not do it because B did it. Do it because you know that God asked you to do it. And he'll back you up. Because if you read Verse 5, Exodus 4, verse 5, it says, That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the father of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, has appeared to you. That's the whole point of you being able to do what others have not been able to do or cannot do. That's the purpose of your personal encounter with the Lord. That's the purpose of your personal invitation by the Lord. He doesn't need to duplicate things. He just needs somebody who will agree with him so that they may believe. That's for the unbelievers. That they may believe. Because Moses asked him at the beginning of the, of the chapter, suppose they will not believe me. Suppose they will not listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. It's the same with Gideon. Put the fleece down. Don't just do it because another person has done it. Your calling is not their calling. Do it. Dare to believe God when you hear his voice. Because he will back up his word. He will back you up. Like, like, like Elijah said, at my word it shall not rain. And God backed it up because he had a one-to-one relationship with God. So this is what we need to do or need to learn to hear the voice of God personally. Even the so-called snake handlers these days, they use various methods like the hook to hold the head of the snake down or, or, and lift you know, small, with small snakes. You can see them. They lift the tail and let it dangle. Because if you dare come near it, of course it will snap. It will bite you. I 
And you see some of them, they died, the snake bite, uh, bites them so often that at the end of their life, they, they, they call themselves snake charmers and they still die by snake bite because all the, you know, the venom has wrecked their body. But God, when God does it, he's pure, he's clean, he's perfect. The word of the Lord is perfect. Con, what does Psalm 19 say? I'm just still going back to Psalm 19 today. Verse 7 of Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So it's not what the world is doing that you are doing. You have to be converted out of that way of life. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That means you have to listen, bring yourself down, humble yourself in the presence of God that he may raise you up. Always claim not to know in God's presence. That's when he will teach you. That's why the Pharisees could learn nothing. Because they claimed to know already. But the, 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 the fishermen who had no education, they learned. Because they claimed to know nothing. They emptied themselves. Jesus, teach us to pray. John the Baptist taught his disciples, you teach us to pray. No, but the Pharisees, they would stand in the, in the marketplaces and, and wear their big clothes and, and, and make their noise. Jesus is like, you are wasting your time. You are doing the, the, the tradition of men. But they were thinking that they knew. So Jesus cursed them. You are blind. You don't know what you are doing. So in God's presence, we always have to empty ourselves out, up, out. Clean, clean yourself up, out. Purge yourself so that God can do something new every day. Like Moses ran away from the snake, but God says, go back. He ran away from Pharaoh, God says, go back. That they may believe. It is God's plan, not your plan. God wants to use you to display his power among the Gentiles, among the unbelievers, that they may believe. That is the whole point. Like Acts 1.8 he says, go to the nations and, 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 and be a witness, witnessing. Your presence in the nations is just to represent God. You shall receive power that you may be a witness. So I'm sending you to do these things on my behalf so that others may see and believe that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to you, that you are not doing your own thing. So when we do mission, when we do evangelism, when we preach, when we, whatever we do in the name of Jesus, let us still remember that we are doing it in the name of Jesus, not in our name. If we just do what others can do, how would the people see the difference between what they worship and call God and, and compare to what you worship and call God? There has to be a difference between the creator of heaven and earth and a piece of stick. When they see the difference, even though they are hardened, like if you read Exodus 5 verse 2, when Moses went to Pharaoh and told him, oh, okay, let me just read it. Uh, Exodus 5, 1 and 2. So afterwards, so after all the encounter, Moses went back to to Egypt appeared to Pharaoh. So afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, 
Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Listen to what Pharaoh answers. And Pharaoh said, verse 2, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice or let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So the purpose of God doing miracles through Moses and Aaron was so that people like Pharaoh may know. Because he says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I do not know him, nor will I let Israel go. So God wants to use you and I to do things so that those who worship sticks and stones can see the difference. Not so that you will be proud. Not so that you can say, look what I can do. But so that they may see and believe. They will see the difference between what they worship and what you worship. Because at the end of the day, Pharaoh became stubborn, lost, he, let me say, lost every, everything in Egypt. Lost his son, lost his army. Lost everything out of stubbornness. Presumptuous sin. Wrong self-image. Pride. Because he had this, the will to choose to disobey. He learned his lesson in a very hard way. He lost everything that, that Egypt had because at the end of the day, children of Israel took everything. And he, his son did not just die. He lost his whole army, he lost his life at the end of the day in the Red Sea. Because nobody can fight this our God and come out without injuries. You can't fight God without without being injured. When God kills, I heard somebody say, when God kills, it's not murder. He's killing you because it's just and right. It's proper punishment for your sin and disobedience. It's not murder. Because people like to say, oh, if God, you say God loves the world, why is, are people dying? How long did he wait for the Amorites to repent? And they did not. So when he told his children, go destroy them, take their land. He wasn't being wicked. He was being just. Because his children were in slavery for no reason. God doesn't kill. It's the devil that kills. God pronounces proper just judgment. Righteous judgment. Because if you touch the apple of his eye, like we read in Psalm 18 this morning, Psalm 18, verse, um, I think verse 10. No, no, we read Psalm 17, sorry. Because I'm going from 18 to 19, I'm mixing up. So we read Psalm 17 this morning. Verse 8 says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. So when you put yourself in God's eyes, when you are the apple of God's eye, who can fight you and win? Psalm 105 clearly says, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. God will protect you as the apple of his eye when you dare to trust him. Psalm 2, we've, we've read it recently. People, you know, he says, why do the nations rage and, and plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So when, when, when they are fighting you, it's not you they are fighting. They are fighting the one that sent you. 
when Moses was, the, sorry, when Pharaoh was dis- disobeying Moses, he wasn't disobeying Moses, he was disobeying God. Because Moses clearly said, the, the Lord, the God of Israel says, thus says the Lord God of Israel. He wasn't speaking of himself. He wasn't speaking from himself. He says, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. So Pharaoh was not disobeying Moses. He was disobeying God directly. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And that's why I say nobody fights God and wins. And to us, you cannot say that you love the Lord without trusting him either. Moses had to trust him to be able to stretch out his hand and pick the serpent by the tail. Noah is another example. Noah had to trust God in order to build the ark that was supposed to protect from the rain that nobody had ever seen. God says, build the ark, and he did it. Because, let's let's look at Genesis chapter 6. And they shall know the truth. And the truth shall set them free. Genesis 6 verse 9 says this is. Now let me, let me read, read verse, uh, verse 7. Let's start from verse 7. No. I'll go backwards. From verse 5. Because I want, I want us to understand the context. Then the Lord saw. Genesis 6 from verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart, that's the heart of man, was only evil continually. That's what I said at the beginning. It's because we have that free will, we choose to use it. We think... You know, at the end of the day, we are doing it against ourselves. It's my body. I can do what I like with it. Go ahead and see who will suffer at the end. And then they will blame God. Okay, God, why did you give me free will? If I didn't give you free will, I wouldn't be a loving father. I I wouldn't be just. Then I would just be a tyrant. Commanding you to do what you want, what I want you to do against your will. You have a choice. This is life, this is death, choose one. So this is God giving human beings everything they had on earth. Even angels came down and, and started messing around. If you read from the beginning of chapter 6 of Genesis, I don't want to. Spend more time on it. So God is saying in verse 5. That the intent of the thoughts of the heart of man was evil continually. Verse 6. And the Lord was sorry. It pained him. Because he made you in his image. So if you can feel, he can feel. It pained him that he made man on the earth. And he was grieved. We talk about do not grieve the Holy Spirit, isn't it? He was grieved in his heart because the love that he had for human beings was not taken. He's giving love and they are slapping him back on the face. It didn't start today. So he was grieved in his heart. Love comes from the heart. And so in verse 7, so the Lord said, I will destroy man. He made, he made us. He's the potter, we are the clay. He can, the, pot, the, the potter can break the pot anytime he likes. I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. 
he was grieved, he was pained in his heart that all his love was not reciprocated. But, verse 8, thank God for Noah. That's what I'm saying. I'm bringing Noah here. But, a big but in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. One man in the whole earth at that time. One man. Not, not a million people, not a thousand people. One single person found grace. Even though everything around him was evil and sinful, he kept his focus on the Lord. So don't come and tell me, oh, he made me do it, she made me do it. Nobody made Noah sin. He focused on the Lord and he did not sin. Everybody was sinning around him. And that's how he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And, and verse 9 clearly says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Listen to this. Noah was a just man. Perfect in his generation. That's the Bible. I'm, I'm not, it's not my word. I will read verse 9 of chapter 6 of Genesis again. Genesis 6 chapter 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man. Perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. He walked with God. That's the only way he could remove his focus from the things that were around him. Because he, daily he was taking a walk with God. That's what, that, that, that was God's initial plan for Adam and Eve. God will come to the garden and they'll fellowship. Noah remembered that and stuck to it. So when every person was sinning around him, he focused on the Lord. Every day he went for a walk with God. That's the only way he could remain who he was. A just man and a perfect man in his generations. It's there. In my book it's, it's plural. Generations. Because he walked with God. He did to trust God. When God said now build the ark, he did not question. He knew God's voice. That's what I said at the beginning. Those little nudges are so that when big things come, you will know his voice. He will test you here and there to see whether you are just doing your thing. Until you give your heart and your life to him and you have this personal walk with him, then you will be oblivious of what is happening around you. Because they are in the world and of the world, but you are not of the world. And that's what Amos 3, 3 says as well. Can two walk together except they, they agree? So until you agree with God, you cannot walk with him. Until you agree with him, you cannot trust him. Until you agree with him, you cannot hear his voice to the extent of daring to, to do certain things. And that's what we want the Holy Spirit to teach us today. Abraham was another man who dared to trust God. Abraham trusted God enough to dare to agree to sacrifice Isaac, his only son. Just because the Lord said so. But how did he learn that kind of obedience? 
in long-term relationship. Daily walk, like in no, no case. Because at the beginning, we know how much he messed up as well. He didn't just wake up one day and, and know how to trust God to that extent. You are old. The only child that God says is your promised child. And one day God says, go sacrifice him. He had to have a certain level of relationship with God to dare to trust that if God sent Ishmael away and says, Isaac is your, your heir. And today he's telling me after Isaac is old enough to carry the wood up the mountain. The child that I had when I was 100 years old. So imagine how old he would have been by then. And he dared to trust God. That means he knew God's voice. He knew who God was. He knew that God is beyond what he can see. God is beyond what he knows. That means God has a way out of this thing, even if, even though I don't know what it is. That is daring to trust God. And such confidence does not come overnight. It comes from long-term relationship. Long-term association like Noah. Noah walked with God. Abraham walked with God. And that's why if, you, if we look at Genesis 20, 22, there's the story of Abraham going to offer up Isaac. It's, you can read that at home from Genesis 22 from verse 1 to 19. But verse 14 says, And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. That is after he had lifted up the, the, the knife to, to slaughter, uh, to, to slay uh, Isaac. The angel of the Lord called out to him, Abraham. Abraham, he says, here I am. He says, do not lay your hand on the lad. From verse 11, I'm just summarizing now. Don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And when Abraham lifted his eyes, he looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket. So Abraham took the ram and offered it instead of his son Isaac. And then verse 14, where I was going, and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. That means you don't know before them. You don't know these things all ahead of time. Otherwise, there's no element of trust. He said, the Lord will provide if you trust. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. God has ways that you don't know. And then, verse 17 because of what Abraham had done, God says, okay, let's just read from, let's continue. I, re, I finished reading 14. Let's read 15 to 17. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn that the angel is speaking in place of God now. So don't, don't mistake it. It's clearly you know, it says this is Jesus speaking. You can, I know it's not written there, Jesus, but you can tell. By myself, the voice, the word of God is speaking, yeah? By myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Listen to the promise. Verse 17. Blessing, I will bless you. 
and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants. So what Abraham did, did not just end with him. The effect of that blessing and multiplication went into generations after. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. That was God's word. In your seed, verse 18, all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That's it. You have obeyed my voice. Daring to trust God. All nations. So God put the blessing of everyone in this world under Abraham. Because of that one act of trust. But he had to learn obedience. If you read Hebrew, that's what it says about Jesus too. He had to learn obedience. He had to obey. Because that kind of relationship does not come by saying the Lord's Prayer once a week. If we just would dare to trust the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, God Almighty, he would provide, he would make the impossible to become possible. Do we dare to trust God? Do we dare to believe his word? Do we dare to accept that he is who he says he is? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word of today. Lord, today we are asking for wisdom. Wisdom to hear you. Wisdom to understand you, to know your voice. Because Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me, they follow me. Lord, give us humility in your presence. So that we will not work in vain. We ask for the humility, not to be presumptuous, not to do what we feel like doing all the time, but to do what you say we would do, even when it hurts, even when it doesn't feel good. Forsaking self-will that is destructive and learning to hand over all things to Jesus. Trusting him who is the author and finisher of our faith. Holy Spirit, we ask for your presence at this moment that you would enable us to dare to trust God. To have that unwavering faith in God and to be able to do what he says. Father, we are asking and we are receiving by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, the spirit of boldness, the spirit of confidence to dare to trust God at his word. We thank you, Father, for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you do not discard us just because we've disobeyed once. You are too loving for that. You give us chance and chance again. Lord, today we've learned it afresh. Help us to dare to trust you. Because Jesus did the same. If not, he would not have gone to the cross. He dared to trust that he will be raised on day three. Help us to follow the footsteps of Jesus. And we give you the glory. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.